This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Islamic State claims responsibility for attack on Nigeria's army base. Uganda launches second round of vaccination for Ebola health workers. Sudan's ruling military council rejects request to hold mediation talks in Addis Ababa. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Searle and Zah, live in Nairobi. For those of you joining us across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for watching. And tonight, I'm alongside my colleague, Rama Nyang, who has our business headlines. Rama. Thank you very much, Richard. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. Ethiopia's parliament has cleared the way for private foreign companies to venture into its lucrative telecommunications sector. And Uganda's counting the cost of containing Ebola at its border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, though, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Richard. Thank you, Rama. Islamic State's West African branch is claiming responsibility for an attack on a Nigerian army base. The assault took place in Borno State, located in northeastern Nigeria. The group is claiming to have killed 20 soldiers. It also said the barracks was burnt and tanks destroyed in the tank, in the attack rather. Islamic State in West Africa split from Boko Haram in 2016. The Nigerian army has yet to respond to ISWA's claims. Well, our very own CGTN's Deji Badmas joins us from Lagos for more on this story. Deji Badmas, Islamic State says it killed 20 Nigerian soldiers in Nigeria's army base in northeastern Borno State. What more can you tell us about that? Well, Richard, that attack actually happened on Wednesday when Nigeria was celebrating Democracy Day, and uh, we understand it was indeed a deadly attack. It was an army base that was actually attacked, known as 158 Tax Force Battalion. We understand the commander of uh, that unit was actually killed, a, a lieutenant colonel. But uh, as we speak, the military has not yet uh, issued a statement on it. The government hasn't spoken about it. So everyone is waiting to hear uh, the version of um, the, the Nigerian government and, of course, the military uh, about what exactly uh, happened. But um, no doubt what uh, we're gathering is that this was a deadly attack and uh, that uh, quite uh, a number of casualties now inflicted on uh, the troops uh, that were stationed uh, at that military base. Richard? Well, Deji, speaking of the government, from what we hear, the government has recently claimed to have almost defeated the insurgents. Can you unpack the situation for us? What's the reality on the ground? Well, the reality is just what you see, Richard, and what we all continue to see and hear. The, the fact is that, well, uh, yes, I indeed, the government says it has degraded. At some point, even say, use the word defeat now, um, the, the uh, Boko Haram. But uh, obviously, uh, with uh, the number of attacks we're seeing, it, it would appear that is not exactly the case, at least on the ground. It, it appears that's exactly not the case. Uh, Boko Haram continues to uh, pose a very serious threat. And um, uh, besides this attack, we, we've seen them carry out a uh, you know, series of attacks. Uh, on Tuesday, we saw an attack by the insurgents as well on the MNJTF, that's uh, the Multinational Joint Tax Force. The Joint Tax Force now comprising uh, troops from Niger, Nigeria, Chad, uh, and of course, Beni. And uh, quite a number, we, we understand about 10 military personnel were killed in that attack. So the uh, fact is that um, the, the fact on ground would, would appear not to support the claim of the government, Richard. Uh, Boko Haram is still a potent force and it still continues to carry out uh, attacks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we are now seeing is that um, the other faction of Boko Haram, known as uh, the Islamic State for West, uh, in West African province now, appears to be targeting military bases and locations. That's, that's what we're beginning uh, to see now, Richard. All right, Deji, that brings me to my next question, and that is what is the difference between the Islamic State in West Africa 
and Boko Haram, and why are they both so vicious? I'm happy you said why are they both so vicious, because both of them are actually vicious. Um, the Islamic State uh, in West African province uh, was uh, set up uh, a, a few, about two years ago. It actually broke away from uh, the main Boko Haram, and that faction actually pledges allegiance now to, to ISIS. Uh, as a matter of fact, at some point, Boko Haram itself as a group, the entire group, actually pledged allegiance to um, ISIS, but uh, at some point, there was a disagreement in the mode of operation of Boko Haram. And so um, the main leader of Boko Haram, Abubakar Shekau, decided you know, to, to break away from that allegiance now. But um, uh, the Islamic State for West African province has actually been led by someone known as uh, al Banawi, who uh, is the son of the founder of Boko Haram. And of course, um, you can clearly see what uh, it, its MO is. It's, it's basically targeted, um, hard targets, if you like. I'm talking about military locations and, uh, and formations now. Uh, for instance, this attack that happened on Wednesday, obviously by um, the Islamic State for West African province. In the case of Boko Haram, uh, it, it goes after soft targets, carry out kidnappings and, and what have you. But the truth is that both of them are very vicious. Both of them are very deadly. Uh, and they're both, um, uh, these are both terrorist, uh, 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 jihadist groups, so to speak, Richard. Deji Badmas, thank you so much for bringing us that story. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Deji Badmas talking to us from Lagos, Nigeria. Moving on. Uganda has started a second round of vaccination to more frontline workers after two people died of Ebola. The vaccine will be given to health workers in districts bordering the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the disease has lasted over 10 months. Now, and around 5,000 health workers had already received the vaccine. Isabel Nakiria reports. Around 4,000 doses of the Ebola vaccine will be given to more health workers as Uganda steps up efforts to stop the spread of the disease. Three people that had been confirmed with Ebola belong to the same family. Two have so far died, while a third case, a three-year-old boy, was sent back to the DRC with four other family members. The family had traveled from the DRC to attend a burial of a relative who died of Ebola. Uganda and the DRC governments agreed to repatriate the family to continue with treatment from there. The victims were a five-year-old boy and his 50-year-old grandmother. For now, the government says that there is no other confirmed case of Ebola in the country. Results of the three new suspected cases are not yet out. The WHO is also assessing whether to declare the outbreak a public health emergency. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN, in Kampala. The World Health Organization has held a meeting in Geneva to decide whether the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo should be declared a global emergency. The virus has killed more than 1,400 people since the outbreak began and was declared the second deadliest in history in August. According to the WHO, the disease has now spread to Uganda, killing two people. The two are said to have arrived in the country with the disease from the Democratic Republic of Congo. All right, moving on. Let's speak to Julia, Julia Leobova. She joins us from Geneva with an update on the, on the meeting. Julia, thank you for taking time out to join us here on Africa Live. Julia, the WHO experts have just finished their meeting on Ebola. What more can you tell us about that meeting? Well, actually, the, uh, the emergency committee meeting uh, uh, or convened by the World Health Organization is still underway as we speak right now. It has been delayed slightly uh, uh, this afternoon, and uh, this, those people are trying to determine 
whether the current Ebola outbreak uh, is, uh, is an international concern. And, uh, well, uh, this uh, meeting is due to finish any moment now, and as soon as it does finish, there will be a press conference. Uh, well, what it is is that this committee comprises of uh, 13 independent experts, and once they make their decision, then the Director General of the World Health Organization will then dis have the final say on whether this is an international emergency. And, uh, well, of course, we are waiting for the outcome of that meeting right now. This uh, committee was convened after a young boy and his grandmother uh, died of Ebola in Uganda uh, after they've arrived from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And at least one more case of Ebola has been confirmed in Uganda as well. Now, this is the third meeting by the in emergency committee. And the first one was in, um, in October 18, and uh, the second one was in April uh, earlier this year. So, uh, but previously, uh, this uh, outbreak hasn't been declared an emer international emergency, but now, we'll, of course, we'll have to wait and see on the outcome of that meeting. Julius, tell us what other, ex what, what other steps do we expect from the WHO in the future in dealing with such outbreaks? Well, indeed, as soon as we have the decision, then we'll see exactly what recommendations this panel of experts actually makes, because once they have the decision, they will then provide those recommendations. It could be a travel ban to the affected uh, countries. It could be a trade ban as well. And uh, also, uh, there will be a boost in public health measures. Vaccinations and monitoring is already in place, of course, for Ebola. Uh, and also, uh, funding will be increased as well to deal with the situation to try to contain this virus. Uh, of course, uh, the WHO says it has hundreds of people on the ground trying to contain and deal with this virus outbreak, but the WHO says that it has the most effective treatment so far that it ever has uh, to deal with uh, this uh, virus at the moment. So we'll have to see exactly uh, uh, if this virus can be contained and exactly what recommendations this panel of experts makes after their meeting. Julia Leobova, thank you so much for your insights. We shall be keeping a close eye on this particular story. Meanwhile, the neighboring South Sudan is appealing for international funding to help keep the Ebola disease out of its borders. Michael Karananja has more on that story. Reported new cases of Ebola in neighboring Uganda has got South Sudan worried. This is because the country also shares a border with the Democratic Republic of Congo to the southwest. Therefore, the threat of Ebola spreading into her borders is real. The confirmed cases in Uganda as uh, uh, a sovereign reminder that the Ebola virus has no respect for borders. With outbreak in DRC not yet under control and spreading, we have to take urgent steps to further protect the people and residents in South Sudan and make sure we can respond quickly if the virus crosses into the country. Juba is therefore appealing for international support in putting in place measures that will ensure that the disease doesn't spill into its territory. South Sudan is urgently needs 12 million to sustain and improve Ebola disease virus preparedness and prevention measures to protect people in the conflict affected, people in the conflict affected uh, uh, country. Since the MOH and the UN and the partners uh, around the table started this work about eight months ago, we have achieved a lot. I think we have about 25 to 30 points of entry where we are monitoring what is happening. Juba has not been sitting back as DRC battles Ebola. The country first initiated Ebola preparedness in August 2018. Since then, till May 2019, up to $13 million has gone into the efforts. South Sudan is still recovering from a four-year civil conflict, and an outbreak of Ebola would be a threat too much to handle for the world's youngest nation. Michael Karanja, CGTN. And now to our continuing coverage of the political events in the neighboring Sudan. The ruling Transitional Military Council now says it has rejected a request by Ethiopia to hold talks with opposition groups in Addis Ababa. This comes a day after the council announced a reshuffle after 70 officials were accused of plotting a coup. Here's Amy McConaughey with the latest. Speaking during a press briefing in the Sudanese capital Khartoum, the Transitional Military Council spokesman Shams al-Din al-Kabashi said the council felt that Sudan is still conducive for holding talks with opposition groups. 
At the same time, the spokesman confirmed that a meeting between the Military Council's chair, Abdel Fattah el burhan and U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Tibor Nagy, had taken place. Yesterday, we expressed to the mediator our wish to start the negotiations within 24 hours. Today, the mediator came to us and we expected an answer. However, we were surprised to learn that there was a request to relocate the negotiations to Addis Ababa. We told them that although we respect and appreciate Addis Ababa's government, leadership and people, we however refused to request to relocate the talks completely. During the talks that were also attended by American ambassador to Sudan, Donald Booth, al Bahan welcomed America's efforts in seeking a peaceful solution to the standoff in Sudan. I speak for the entire international community wants exactly what the Sudanese people want. We all want a civilian-led government that is acceptable to the Sudanese people. We want Sudan to escape its economic difficulties, and we would like to see Sudan play that very positive role in the region that is historically Sudan's to play. Ethiopia, under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, recently initiated mediation efforts. This came days after a violent crackdown on protesters who were camping outside the country's military headquarters. Tens of protesters were killed. Amy McConaughey, CGTN. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi says Egypt's support to the Libyan National Army Forces will remain unchanged. Cairo vowed to continue assisting the LNA's counterterrorism campaign of Western Libya militias that support the government of national court. Al-Sisi's announcement came during a meeting in Cairo with the Speaker of the Libya Eastern Parliament, Aguila Saleh. More details with our correspondent, Adel al -Marki. Two days after the Security Council extends its arms embargo over Libya, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi renews his unwavering support to the Libyan National Army Forces. In a meeting with Aqila Saleh, the Speaker of the Libyan Parliament, El Sisi said the Tobruk-based parliament is the legitimate representative of the Libyan people. He didn't mention the UN-backed government of national accord in Tripoli. By reconfirming his recognition to the parliament, President El Sisi wants to display that Egypt supports Libyan institutions, especially the parliament, because it's the only elected entity that has been recognized internationally. Therefore, it should be recognized as a representative of the Libyan people. Cairo has always supported Khalifa Haftar, the leader of the LNA forces which controls the border with Egypt. Egypt is not supporting Haftar as a person. It is supporting the Libyan National Army as an institution. This support is to empower the LNA role in fighting terrorism, a strategy that the Egyptian president has been following. They are terrorists and dangerous militia in Tripoli and they are controlling the capital. It's the third official meeting with Libyan leaders El Sisi holds since Haftar announced a military offensive against his rivals in Tripoli last April. Many of Haftar's rivals are Islamist groups and militias that support the head of the government of National Eckerd Faisal Sarraj. Egypt has included several of these groups to its terror lists. So what Cairo hails as a counter-terrorism campaign could also be an operation by Haftar to eliminate many of his opposing political powers. Adel Mahrouis, CGTN. Cairo. You are watching Africa Live on CGTN. We have a lot more interesting and wonderful stories coming your way, including Egypt looking forward to fifth Sika summit. South Africa's Hauteng Youth Expo exposes youth to academic and career options. So your parking is higher? Yeah. Ah, good job. Thank you. But why do you want to go to the church? It's hard to face the marriage. I have to leave the time, and I have to leave the things here. Okay. Yes, 
我很想看看这个世界，很想了解不同的地方的文化。不管你在哪里，你都可以创作，你都可以思考，你都可以感受到音乐。我会非常想念他们，而不只是这个风景优美的小岛。嗯、因为中国是我们家，然后肯定要太美了。哦，真。Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Tunisia Now, and the head of the United Nations missions in Libya, Hassan Salami, has arrived in Tunis. Salami met with Tunisia's foreign minister and the country's president. The officials discussed the situation in Libya and the resulting humanitarian and security crisis. As CGTN's Adnan Shawashi reports, Salame and Tunisian authorities reviewed ways to encourage Libyans to resume the political process under the auspices of the United Nations. The head of the UN support mission in Libya has discussed in Tunis the latest developments in Libya. The visit comes one day after the tripartite meeting between the foreign ministers of Tunisia, Algeria and Egypt on the ongoing crisis in the North African state. The situation in Libya is very bad. Libya's neighbors and the international community must work together to resolve the crisis. There is no coherence and division within the UN Security Council on the Libyan issue. The situation complicates the task of Dr. Salame. Hassan Salame warned against the security situation in Libya and its impact on the political settlement. In brief, the situation in Libya has severely deteriorated in the past two and a half months. We've been trying to accelerate the political situation with different plans, including the meeting between Mr. Haftar and Mr. Saraj last February. We also called for a large meeting of all Libyans in the city of Gadam. All these plans have failed. Salame added that the number of victims and displaced civilians from Tripoli is on the rise. The political situation which was put in place before the 4th of April cannot continue as it was. After the armed clashes which caused more than 670 Libyan victims, over 3,000 injuries and more than 91,000 displaced. During his meeting with the head of state, Salami pointed out that stopping the ongoing fighting before the resumption of dialogue is a priority for the UN support mission in Libya. Tunisian President Beji Khaid Sibsi and Ghassan Salami stressed the importance of the pivotal role played by the neighboring countries, especially Tunisia, Algeria and Egypt, in intensifying contacts with the Libyan stakeholders and laying the foundations for a durable political solution in Libya. Adnan Shabashi, CGTN, Tunis. We now head to South Africa where the job and economic opportunities came under the spotlight at the Hauteng Youth Expo held in Nazarek, south of Johannesburg. The annual event brings together various government departments and the private sector to expose young people to a variety of academic, career and business opportunities. CGTN's Yulisa and Jamela has more. June is recognized as Youth Month here in South Africa since the dawn of democracy back in 1994. Youth Day and Youth Month are utilized to highlight the challenges that affect young people here in South Africa. This Youth Expo forms part of the provincial government's flagship initiative to empower the young people in the country's economic hub, Gauteng province. They come here under one roof. More than 200 exhibitors, grab the exhibitor that uh, meets your desires, let your life change. You can't come in here and go out and remain the same. It will never happen. So we just want young people to explore this opportunity and take advantage of the investment they've put for them. Hundreds of young people hungry for economic and career opportunities got to explore what's on offer. For many of them, this expo is an eye-opener. So far I've learned a lot and like I'm seeing like things that I am interested in. My career was doing aviation 
but like I lost interest in aviation because I didn't do science. But like coming back to it, it like showed me that I can do aviation, but like with maths and luckily I'm doing maths. I've gotten more information about nursing as I want to do nursing and that I have to supplement my maths if it's poor, like in, if it hasn't reached the requirements. And then I found out more about the forensic side because I still want, I want to do forensics too. It's been great and very helpful because now I have a real good idea of what I want to do next year. And I've found different opportunities. I registered almost everywhere, but now I know where I exactly want to go and what I want to study. Because well, coming here, I didn't have any idea, any idea of what I want to do next year. The youths are the highest unemployed in this country and it's no surprise that high school learners lined up to access information on careers. In line with South Africa's stated intention and desire to be a leader in the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, most exhibitors here are showcasing 4IR technologies. Basically, it's just to prepare the kids for the fourth industrial revolution. So if we can start them at a very young age, from as little as five, six year old, I believe they stand in a great opportunity to have an idea uh, when they venture into uh, varsity. This expo is held on an annual basis to assist students. Yudis Njomela for CGTN in Soweto, South Africa. The United Nations mission in South Sudan says it has completed repairs on 2,500 kilometers of roads in the country. South Sudan's road network is one of the worst in the region, with many parts of the country cut off from the capital. Many routes become impassable during rainy seasons. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports from Juba. The UN says these engineers from China, Bangladesh, India, Thailand and South Korea have been working intensively. They have been leveling and grading roads across South Sudan for six months. They are also repairing supporting infrastructure such as drains and bridges. The UN mission in South Sudan says better roads can promote peace. When people are able to move from place to place, they meet with each other and they build trust and confidence between communities. In some areas where roads have improved, we have seen a decrease in violence in areas between the groups in those areas and an increase in reconciliation. Many here say improved access is making an impact on their lives. This road was a very rough, big holes and even movement is very difficult, especially when we are going with the ambulance driving from uh, the camp up to Juba. But uh, right now, I appreciate uh, what is going now is good. With these good roads, it means peace has come. When the road was bad, I could repair my motorbike six times traveling from my village to the town. It takes a lot of money, and yet I also have to pay school fees for my children. The UN says improved roads can enable humanitarian agencies to reach more communities in need. It says it will save millions of dollars traveling by road rather than relying on transporting aid by air. The United Nations mission in South Sudan says it will now be easier to support their bases and deploy peacekeepers more efficiently and effectively. It says it also hopes this initiative will help those returning to their homes after six years of conflict to have easy access. Patrick Koyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. 3D printing is a leading invention changing operations in the technological age. The technology is bridging the manufacturing gap in the engineering, architecture, health and education sectors. Kenya's 3D printing is being included in crucial medical procedures in an effort to improve access to quality care. CGTN's Beryl Oro brings us that story. Doctors are often faced with unique pathologies that demand renewed approach. This has created room for the inclusion of 3D printing to save lives and improve quality of care for patients. This particular one is uh, of a patient who had a tumor on his scalp that was going into the skull. And uh, we'd been consulted by the neurosurgeons 
um, to help in terms of planning the size of the mesh that they would use to fill the gap once they had removed the tumor. So that is another interesting case. This is actually our most recent case. Dr. Ogalo and his consulting team of doctors use these innovative approaches to healthcare to offer quality services, especially to the poor. A lot of the work that we've done so far has been completely pro bono um, to just give patients access to the cutting edge technology and not make it such um, a distant cry or something that you know, they only hear of or see of on, on television. When the case of the conjoined twins presented, a 50-strong multidisciplinary team of doctors were faced with the challenging task of conducting the operation at the Kenyatta National Hospital in Nairobi, and the introduction of 3D cast breached that gap. We had never had um, a case that was as complex in, just in terms of the surgery alone and everything surrounding the the patient. So this presented uh, a challenge to the entire team. Because this is the one that we had to get right. What we have is the two children sitting back to back, so to speak, joined in the center. And we're then able to use this particular cast, even intraoperatively as we're operating on the twins, to, to guide us, to use it as what we call a surgical guide. The doctors performed the surgery for 23 hours. Now the priority was of course, one was to preserve the lives of both the children. And two was to ensure that after the surgery, even it being a successful surgery, we had to make sure that the twins were able to walk at the end of the day. After the successful separation of the conjoined twins, the use of 3D printing technology under the team, a prestigious publication in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery Case Reports. We see a place or a point at which Every hospital in the country, public and private, does have an in-house 3D printer with 3D printing technicians or people experienced in the field to be able to generate these kind of, of models to improve the care, the quality of care across the board for these kind of patients. We are trying to see, or we actually have I mean, projects in the pipeline for not just printing um, physical anatomic models such as these ones, but taking a leap further and actually trying to 3D print live tissues and live organs. And for the next generation of medical professionals set to march this reality, there is a need for change from the point of entry at the medical schools. We need to train innovators in medicine as opposed to just uh, clinicians. And once we start doing that, then it opens up the whole healthcare industry to a lot more possibilities and a lot more solutions for our own people. In Africa, the pace of adoption of technological advancement faces several barriers, including finance, lack of policy, and lack of adequate support within the sector. However, positive outcomes from well researched innovative approaches are creating space for both medicine and technology to leverage on each other's strengths for the greater good. Burial Oro. CGTN. In Kenya, Chinese conservation ambassador Jiang Yiyan has visited the anti poaching scene at the Maasai Mara National Reserve. The reserve is home to 95 species of mammals and 450 species of birds. Yiyang, together with the CEO of the Mara Elephant Project, Mark Goss, are in charge of wildlife protection action in the area. They are both responsible for air searching the Mara, while Petrol Patrol Commander Elvis is responsible for the ground operation. Since 2017, China's Alibaba Foundation and the Paradise International Foundation jointly set up a Protected Area Ranger Award Fund in Africa to reward African first-line patrollers. I'm an actress. I'm also a wildlife advocate and a wild aid ambassador for rhinos. I have worked for some time now in Africa with wild aid. This is Africa Live on CGTN. Time now to hand over to Rama, who has our business headlines. Rama. Quite so, Richard. Here's what's coming up in business. The open legislators cleared the way for foreign investors to venture into the country's telecommunications sector. And Uganda is counting the cost of having to contain the Ebola outbreak on its border with the DRC.
Business in Africa is at the crossroads where opportunity meets innovation, where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor to the shout of a trader in a bustling free market. It's colorful, vibrant and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the dealmakers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Let's go to Ethiopia. Legislators over there have approved a draft law that effectively allows foreign companies to invest in the country's telecommunication sector. The Ethiopian Communication Regulatory Proclamation will also be setting up an independent sector regulator accountable to the Prime Minister. For decades, foreign telecommunication companies have been locked out entirely of the fast-growing and large market. And the market over there has been served by a state-run monopoly, Ethio Telecom. Kenya-based Safaricom is already providing Ethio Telecom with fiber connectivity and other services. Management over there say the partnership has potential to expand. MTN also has shown interest in getting into one of the last prime untapped markets on the continent. The new law is the latest in a series of sweeping reforms which Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali has implemented ever since he became the country's leader some two years ago. Over in Kenya, the government will more than double capital gains tax from 5% to 12.5% if legislators approve that proposal. The country's finance minister, Henry Rotich, proposed that increase as part of efforts to boost tax revenues in the East African economy. Kenyan legislators now have about two weeks or so to decide whether or not to approve the proposal when the debate on the 2019 finance bill begins. For years, Kenyans didn't actually demand capital gains tax, even though her neighbors in East Africa did apply it between a rate of 20 and 30 percent. As part of his proposals, the finance minister offered exemptions in a range of contexts, including companies relocating their businesses, property meant for administering the estate of a diseased person, or transfer of property between spouses as part of a divorce settlement. Next door in Uganda, the government there has banned all public gatherings in the western Kasese district in order to prevent further cases of Ebola. That decision follows the deaths of two people in the country days after the deadly hemorrhagic virus spread from the DRC, where it's killed over 1,300 people. Here's CGTN's Leon Senyange with the latest. Uganda's health ministry is intensifying its Ebola response. Health authorities have banned public gatherings in the Kasese district where three patients were being treated for Ebola. The ministry would like to reassure all Ugandans and all other residents in Uganda that with the experience and expertise available in the country and the over 10 months of preparedness, the disease will be contained. The Ministry of Health is set to carry out ring vaccination of all people believed to have come in contact with the confirmed Ebola cases. More than 400 doses of vaccines have been made available. Health officials say vaccination is scheduled to start on Friday, but there will also be extensive surveillance at the unofficial entry points at the Uganda DRC border. Thousands of people cross through the shared border posts with the Democratic Republic of Congo. People should get to know facts about Ebola. If they know how to detect it, they can quickly report for a person who crossed through this informal border point and is staying in a specific village if they are seeing some unusual signs or symptoms on this person in the family. The western part of Uganda, where the cases have been reported, has several major tourist sites. The health ministry says tourists visiting the area aren't in danger and the industry isn't letting its gut down. We vet the place in terms of are they uh, the people in the communities vaccinated, they get the, the treatment, is the earlier code really safe? So we look at all that, we put it into consideration before we dispatch our trials. Yeah. The current Ebola epidemic started in August last year in eastern DRC and has killed over 1,200 people. More than $18 million has so far been spent by the government of Uganda and its partners on the Ebola preparedness and readiness. 
Leon Sanyanga Sijitian, Kampala, Uganda. Back to Ethiopia for a moment. Kenya's Equity Bank has become one of the first foreign banks to acquire a license to operate in that country. Now, the bank has opened a representative office in Addis Ababa as it prepares to start operations in July. Equity banks entering into Ethiopia is a pretty big move for a country that previously guarded its banking sector very, very tightly. Kenya's largest lender by consumer base uh, intends to use its digital and virtual banking products in order to reach millions of Ethiopians who lack access to formal financial services. Equity also moved into a range of other countries, Zambia and Mozambique, back in May 2019, and it has subsidiaries at, as we speak in South Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Germany has raised over $7.4 billion from its 5G mobile spectrum auction after a near three-month battle that will see a fourth operator get into that market. Now, the sum pledged in a record 497 rounds of bidding for the 41 blocks on offer was more than analysts actually expected. The market leader bid $2.44 billion, 430 megahertz slot uh, in, of the 420 megahertz. That was essentially being auctioned. Vodafone also got a similar amount, 130 megahertz, paying $2.11 billion. Telefonica Deutschland secured 90 megahertz for $1.59 billion. In the end, the auction raised more than the $5.73 billion from 2015's 4G Spectrum auction, but a lot less than the $56 billion or so forked out by bidders in a rather ruinous auction back in the year 2000. What happens with the auction return if we look at these far too expensive prices, three times as high as in Austria? One could have built around 50,000 basis stations. This could have been a complete network or 1.5 networks as they exist today. Now the work begins. If we really want to be 5G leaders in Germany, we have to work out the right framework in the coming weeks to strengthen the network operators in order to push the investment further. By the last couple of weeks, you've probably heard quite a bit about rare earth minerals. They're widely used in modern manufacturing. Now, these are lanthanide elements, about 15 of them, to use a formal term. And they're used in everything from oil production to making permanent magnets to making electric motors or going to electric vehicles. CGTN's Li Jianhua visited a factory that manufactures permanent magnet products in the central Chinese city of Ganzhou. It's a place with abundant deposits of rare earths. You're looking at frisial demium and new demium alloys. They may sound technical, but they're wisely used in your daily life. Melted under high temperatures, together with other metals and elements, they're forged into these thin plates. They are then fed into a huge grinding machine to be made into powder, which is ground into even smaller particles in these pores. And now they're ready to be whipped into permanent magnetic products that you likely use. Zhu Ming has been in the business for over 20 years. This product is mainly used as a core component of new energy vehicles' motors. If they don't use the material, the energy consumption will be very high. The development of new energy vehicles is currently limited to their battery capacity. The rare earth permanent magnet material can facilitate the industry's development. Rare earth permanent magnetic products are also wisely used in other devices, including speakers, mobile phones, planes and military equipment, to enhance their performance and reduce size. Located in a place abandoned with rare earth materials, Ganjo City alone, according to business insiders, has about 40 companies making rare earth permanent magnetic products and its supply chain is more mature. China provides a large quantity of rare earth particles globally, which stimulates innovation and more investment compared to other countries. The supply chain is not replaceable by any other country. Figures show China's rare earth reserves account for nearly 40 percent of the world's total, and China's production of rare earth minerals in 2018 accounted for 70 percent of the world's production. Official figures show China's rare earth exports in the first five months of 2019 were less than 20,000 tons, dropping by over 7% compared to the same periods last year. 
China has created regulations on issuing rare earth export licenses things to Southern Eleven, but there has been no limit as for numbers and qualifications of these licenses. Other than that, there are no other regulations regarding their exports. Some big importers of China's rare earth minerals include Germany, Japan, and the U.S. Chief among them, 80% of the U.S. imports of these minerals came from China from between 2014 and 2017. If some countries or companies make use of rare earth resources to make some high-end tech products, and in the meantime, surprise China's development. This will definitely hurt Chinese people's feelings. Bloomberg earlier quoted an expert as saying China could wreak havoc on American industries if it is limits exports of rare earth materials to the U.S. Rare earth minerals are widely used in modern society, from military defense equipment to home appliances for cars and even to the mobile phones you use every day. You don't see them, but without them, we'd be in trouble. Li Jianhua, CGTN, Ganzhou, Jiangxi Province. I'll leave you there for the time being, but I'll be back at the top of the hour. We'll be focusing on two countries in Eastern and Central Africa, Tanzania and the DRC. The former is offering the DR Congo incentives to attract importers to use its port of Dar es Salaam. What are they and how exactly will they work? We'll find out live from Dar es Salaam at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, though, back to Richard. Thank you, Rama. This is Africa Live on CGTN. Once again, uplifting and inspiring stories coming your way. Let's take a look at the headlines. South Africa's artists' unique jewelry inspired by architecture and color. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to South Africa Now. And Incantura is a contemporary African jewelry brand founded by Zimbabwean-born Patisiwe Katura Shlongwane. Shlongwane's unique pieces are a combination of layering of geometries with materials. It merges the skills gained in architecture with a fascination in color and materials. CGTN's Yolisa and Jamela has more. Johannesburg-based jewelry designer Patisi Wekadura Shlongwane started painting at the age of five. As a young adult, she trained to become a professional architect, but continued to nurture a passion for fashion design. She also started to create jewelry on the side, a hobby that she found to be quite liberating. So for me it was more I was passionate about design, but mainly clothing and fashion. And so I decided to actually start exploring that. And during the process um, I was working for a, a fashion brand and then I started designing my own products to sell. So I started with jewelry because I thought it would be much more manageable. And as I was doing it, I just found that I really enjoyed it, so I just continued with it. Shongwane would soon start her Ingantura brand of unique jewelry pieces. She tells us that the name means perfume or essence. So the brand is essentially about people expressing themselves and the essence. Ingantura jewelers create pieces for those who love art and want to make a bold statement. Yeah, I think my brand pretty much reflects who I am because I'm very expressive. So I think the pieces are very, um, I like to call them statement pieces. So they are very expressive. Songwane says she aims to uphold authenticity and a respect 
for local production in her designs. She recently did a collaboration with Amarula on a concept meant to celebrate African designs. So the designs all vary. Some of them are based on different elements such as shapes like for instance I have a drum ring this one I'm wearing is called a sundial ring which is like a sun and then with some of them it's more to do with geometries and I usually like to layer things so it's about playing around with the materials and seeing how those materials can be layered together and how the different shapes work together which I think is more from the architectural side. Her pieces are fast gaining popularity and her clientele is ever increasing. So I would say right now my market is um, global because I'm supplying some people who are also in other countries such as Australia and the US and um, the UAE. And I also have a lot of local clients who also appreciate the brand. Shongwane is now keen to collaborate with other designers. You listen to Jamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, the news continues on Africa Live. We've got your sports news coming up after the break. Don't go away. Don't touch that dial. Here's a sneak peek at the headline. And in sports, 2011 world champions Japan defeat Scotland to take Group D lead. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to the Women's World Cup. We go 2011 champions. Japan has defeated Scotland 2-1 to in Rennies in their Group D tie of the FIFA Women's World Cup. The Japanese opened the score sheet in the 23rd minute through Mana Iwabuchi's strike. In the 37th minute, Scotland skipper Rachel Corsi was at fault as she pulled Yuika Sugasawa down, resulting to a penalty in which Sugasawa converted from the spot. Scotland was able to salvage a goal in the 88th minute through Lana Cleland, but it was late and Japan took the three points. Japan now leads Group D with four points after two matches, just a point above England, who will be facing Argentina later on. And still in the FIFA Women's World Cup, England will face Argentina.